Oh, man, that was dope. Yes, it's time to do what we do and check out the game we've been rocking with or the game we've been thinking about getting. Or maybe forget about the video and storm the comment section with Haterade about the game you watching videos about for some reason. Either way, let's get it cracking with the most star citizen and the best things you can do in the verse. Like up, sub up, and ring up like a boss. Run into the back of the ship, hopping into a fighter and detaching from the mothership. Wasp the sci-fi TV show vibes all over the place. So many people solo the constellation motherships that when the fighter detaches, it's surprise, surprise, right in your eyes. There's no substitute for the feeling you get when you hop out your seat in the middle of combat, scramble your way through the ship, past the doors, back to the docked fighter, screw up several times trying to enter the thing, then hop in, crank it up, waiting to detach. Coming around, coming around, coming then when you're wondering what the holdup is, you drop out of the ship while your buddy's maneuvering the big bird, and you start looking for a target. It would be worth the time and expense and heartache to build a hydraulic chair that's only purpose is to drop when the ship detaches. It's such a quality moment that everybody should experience. For some reason, the Connie series are the only ships that deploy a fighter this way. Other ships have dedicated hangar bays or enough space to hold and launch a ship out of, but nothing that lets you drop out the ship like a torpedo on the move. It's the bee's knees for the real OGs. But as the making of this vid, the ongoing development has broken something on the back end to let the mothership pilot grant you access to redock with the ship and I don't really expect it to be fixed till 3.23 drops. Still the hotness though. I know DCS lets you refuel your own plane, not sure about being able to deliver fuel. Elite Dangerous has refueling by shooting limpets at you. But where's the space games with the full experience? Until we officially expand outward to Pyro, which is a solar system twice the size of our current home in Stanton, ship to ship refueling is a rare necessity, and so the ships that can do it spend most of their time in the hangar collecting dust. But on scarce occasions, the need is very real and a relief when a Starfarer shows up for the rescue. It's in space where you don't have to match speeds to stay connected, but it's engaging lining up just right to connect to the nozzle. Then you can let your breath go when you make your purchase and the fuel starts flowing. On the operator side of things, it's nice to be able to provide a support role because combat is a space game staple, but lending a hand to someone who needs it is an appreciated diversion from the normal game loops. Of course, when jumping back and forth from a very large star system leaves the test bed and becomes available to all of us, there will definitely be folks price gouging stranded ships, but hey, it is what it is. Even though you're not running around doing a thousand things, it's very cool, very immersive to hop on the controls of this ship extend the boom, control the valves and the flow. I don't know if it was a me thing, but I didn't remember seeing any indication that the ship that was taking the fuel was full, so I wasted some quantanium. But hopefully when I rewatch this, I'll see some text or a blinking light or something that I missed. Refueling is kind of a low impact, stress-free gameplay loop. A little bit of a space dad's delight. I don't really know what a space dad is, so I've seen that Lee Dangerous guy say. Anywho, it's easy peasy, but you can destroy your rig if you're not careful. Too much pressure from the valves will blow the boom, the smithereens, maybe even ruin one of those big tanks with all the gold juice in it. Since everything is out in space, you don't have to worry about a fire, but maybe once the fire systems do come online, it could be a problem when refueling an atmosphere. That's how you start forest fires, other berry. We take it for granted because we use it every day in the verse, but it's splendiferous to the 25th power. Feel free to do your Googles on why this is magnificent from a dev standpoint, but Moving across the physics grid on a planet or moon, then onto or into a vehicle, then the vehicle onto a ship's physics grid, and then flying that onto another ship's physics grid and walk around it while the ship is flying and pitching and yawing. It takes some doing to make it happen, Captain. Very few, if any, companies want to put the resources into those developmental gymnastics, so to be able to frivolously take advantage of it in a gaming session is a beautiful thing. Making a ship and vehicle turducken might look like a waste of time, but when you got big organizations out there doing 50 versus 50 or bigger battles, it's a handy dandy thing to be able to squeeze as much as you can into fewer ships. The Kraken and Capital ships will fill out those roles a lot better, but for now, we gotta make it do what it do. Space Engineers let you EVA, and there's even a few others that have gameplay specifically around EVA combat. But what games let you fly a ship, get out of the seat, and seamlessly move to a good old stroll in space? Whether it's from the seat of a fighter or out the ramp, elevator, or airlock of your ship, it's hard to beat the freedom to move about anywhere without loading screens or teleporting or other means that aren't just you naturally moving through environments. 
EVA is a space nerd's fantasy. Players of other games want it bad enough that they've gone the lengths to find some trickery that'll kind of let you do it. I've seen it done in Starfield, and my old buddy Mars from Ghost Wrath found a funny way to do it in one of his live streams for Elite Dangerous. A lot of folks thought this was impossible, then CIG actually dug in and made it happen. An entire planet covered in city and infrastructure. You can circumnavigate the entirety of the planet looking for the seams, some bare spots, some inconsistency, and if you do, let me know. But all I found in the time spent flying is endless terraforming on the Borg-like level. Wall-to-wall -wall carpet of industrialization. Living spaces and businesses stacked on top of shops and venues. It's incredible to see and know that it just goes on endlessly. As much as I love Starfield, it kind of became the poster child for loading screens, but theirs is just the most obvious. Not sure about X4 loading screens, but there's a lot of saving screens that interrupt you. Even Elite Dangerous has them, but hides them with which space that you travel through between systems and re-entry glide while coming in for a landing. Not sure what the ship is gliding on since there's no atmosphere. There's no loading screens here, which doesn't make it a better game, but it makes it a more fluid game. None to get between you and the flow of your session. I mean, well, there's bugs to help you out with that. <laughs> but nothing built in that won't be remedied later. It's become such an ordinary thing to not have any loading screens in the game that I imagine a lot of the million plus citizens were the ones making all the noise about Starfield's loading screens. Personally, loading screens don't bother me in any game, but it's a great experience to leave a bunker, travel to the ship, break atmosphere, land on the station, and not have to wait for any of it to load. Everything just streams in and out without you noticing, except on occasion when a space station pops in a little late. <laughs> yeah, I've crashed into a couple of those. Typically, what you get in the game is a biome archetype or trope. A forest planet, a desert planet, an ice planet. That's if you get to travel to and land on different planets at all. It's cool to have at least a limited degree of environmental diversity, but it's always been a stretch for one planet to have one climate around the entire globe. Film studios be like, hey, you got the budget for one locale and a soundstage. Make it work. So everybody goes to Vancouver and Georgia and makes it work. Hell, the Godfather barely squeaked by going to Italy for when Michael Corleone had to go on the run after popping Salazzo and McCluskey. Nowadays, studios are shooting more and more on video walls like you might have seen The Mandalorian do. They're changing the game up for what's possible. In game development, when you got shareholders and a board looking to flip projects like burgers so they can get paid and get the next one going, you don't have years and years to get it done, so you don't do the groundbreaking stuff. You do just enough to beat the clock and check the box. And in that case, when it comes to locations, it's just way more viable to say this world is for snow, this world is a jungle, and leave it at that. Everybody else does their job and you ship the game in time for the holidays. It's a cynical way to look at game development, but that's how it is when you're not Rockstar Games or, in this case, Cloud Imperium Games. This is Microtech. The lore is that this planet was owned by the UEE and the terraforming error turned it mostly frigid, then sold it off to Magnus Tobin, the CEO of the electronics manufacturer of Microtech, because Tobin figured it'd be ideal to keep the company's server farmers cool. The result is a planet with six biomes from Little House on the Prairie Fields of Flowers to Lord of the Rings Blizzardy Mountains. Each biome gently blends into the next using the various tools within Planetech V4 that account for things like weather and erosion and to give floral fields naturally transitioning to forests and mountains and frozen tundras and frozen lakes. This is one planet and it's more than you could ever explore and that's not even taking into account the various rivers, caves, shelters, bunkers, settlements, labs, outposts, and new Babbage. It's gonna get even more dense with stuff later this year with the biodiversity of wildlife, player outposts, and distribution centers which are being prepped for testing. I'ma just say it, I'ma wait in the rover while the homies go explore the caves full of things that bite. I'll have a nice view of the mountains while pretending not to hear the screams. I know there's gotta be gas giants in some game out there, but I haven't seen any myself. It's a puzzle in itself just figuring out how to represent the scale. They call them giants for good reason. What's it gonna look like? Do you flash boil everybody's PC with endless volumetric clouds? What kind of meaningful gameplay takes place in it? If I were to guess if any other games have gas giants, they start with a loading screen and you're just there in the middle of, well, in the outer layers of it and you do a little combat till you get a loading screen to the next thing. That's not a lot of incentive to actually build an entire gas giant planet, so you never get to fly to the planet Bespin, enter the atmosphere, and make your way down into Cloud City. But you can make your way to Crusader, enter the atmosphere, and make your way down to Orison. 
It's a network of interconnected thruster mounted platforms maintaining a steady altitude while Crusader industry builds its ships with the benefit of breathable air. Taking a stroll in a gas giant isn't something that usually even crosses people's minds, so it's a unique experience to look at the sights and if you happen to have haptics, feel the rumble of your controller as the thrusters fire the occasional burst to maintain level altitude with the rest of the platforms. Pretty surreal thing to do a little shopping, then head out and take a tram to another platform with none but vapor under you as far as you can see. The sunsets diffused through the layers of clouds are probably as good as it gets, at least till the new cloud tech is released. The only thing that make it better, besides performance for some people, is when we see the space whales dipping between the clouds. But for now, the plushies will have to do. Ship interiors are not unique to Star Citizen. Warframe has ship interiors that you can walk around with two or three of your buddies and shout out to Digital Extremes for pulling that off. Their ships are basically a game map with canopies and windows that through some trickery look out onto a completely separate game map, which is a space scene that you see. X4 is a single player game that allows you to walk through most of the ship. Space engineers even let you design your own. This multiplayer game I think does it best. The design and vibe of the ships fit their respective functions to the T. They actually have functional things to do outside of the cockpits and bridges with more in coming. They can even carry ground vehicles with them that you can drive in and out of them with no teleporting or loading screens breaking up your immersion. The Mustang Beta is a little camper van with an interior that seems bigger than the exterior, made for long distance travel in a small comfortable package. It's got everything you need from a cook stove, bed, and bathroom. The Argo Raft almost requires a flannel shirt and lunch pail and moving about in it gives a distinct vibe that you on the job. There's no luxury, just equipment and ladders and operator controls. The Gitter Dunn Orange touches around the ship reminds you that you on a work site. Matter of fact, just being on the ship makes you feel forklift certified. The biggest problem with the interior is that you can't pipe in Use Me by Bill Withers over the comm while everybody's on the job. Matter of fact, we don't need that option across the board, CIG. Anvil's Valkyrie is the consummate troop carrier. Lean on atmosphere and heavy on the things you need to get bodies in a vehicle or two into battle. Jump seats to put asses in and weapon racks between them. The second deck is accessed by a ladder bringing you to the crew beds placed in close proximity to the top turret and remote turret so they can be reached quickly on a moment's notice. Interior is unmistakably combat oriented. Even someone unconvinced by the second deck couldn't help but hear Fortunate Son playing in their head when the side door is open and the barrels get to spinning. There was a dev that said ship interiors wouldn't add anything to the gameplay loops. He said some other things that were a little ee, but he was right about that point. He was right about it if their development goals wouldn't include gameplay loops to accompany the ship interiors for some reason. It's what I think about sometimes when I'm in this ship. The Aegis Reclaimer is a big Vogon constructor ship in the sky from the exterior, but the alien movie vibes are alive on this giant salvage ship that areas by getting rich in. It's a wealth generator, but it's also rich in atmosphere and gameplay loops. Walking the P ways of a ship that deals in scrap ain't supposed to look luxurious, and it doesn't. It looks used, maybe a little beat up and kind of creepy. The captain quarters and crew quarters have an old style look to them, which is kind of impressive for a futuristic space game. But yeah, it looks like it's been in service for a long, long time. Aesthetics aside, it's a cooperative multi-crew beast between the pilot, the claw control seat, the two salvage turrets, and the salvage processing deck. You can easily put about five or six people to work and still have empty stations for gunners. And that's before the drone room and scanning stations come online. The Reclaimer has probably helped folks build their friend list faster than any other ship in any game. You get owners in chat looking for crew and random people in chat looking to become crew. People get together, hop in different stations, break down derelict ships together. People in the back grab the process salvage and warehouse it up between four different decks. It's a beautiful garbage filled symphony. One of the smaller ships in the game, but one of the most useful in meeting its function is the Anvil C8R Pisces Rescue. Its small size and speed make it useful to use, but the interior is where it shines. You walk through a decon chamber and enter a recognizably hospital white interior. Well, after you cut on the lights. A tier three med bed is at the ready to shove a wounded citizen in. Control surface sits on hand for those who can't operate the bed themselves. And when you gotta drop in and leave the ship for a house call on foot, it's stocked with every medication you may need. 
water for the dehydrated, plus a little food. A jump seat is on deck to evacuate your patient's buddy too. Storage sits up high and out of the way, and it has just enough space to bring in a box that you can use for extra supplies or guns or armor or whatever else you can think of. Might not be a ton of room to stretch out in, but it's so built to purpose that you can survive inside of this ship indefinitely. Ships aren't the only vehicles with interiors. The RSI Lynx is one of the ground vehicles with space to sea walk in. Built for bonafide comfort on the road, it packs in more than just the shampoo on ice. Gun racks and storage and shelves, fold out monitors and swiveling chairs for a better view out the window or to look the other person in the eye when you hit them with the reverse Uno. Flip the light switches, remix the mood and get a better look at the branding projected off the ceiling. Never been a fan of road trips, but this will do right here. And these are just a handful of the interiors of the 200 ships and ground vehicles in Star Citizen. Say what you want about the game, but you can't say the interiors ain't swagnificent. What you could say is other games have something similar to some of the features, and you could be right. But what other game has all of them? Check this out for a feature that another game does have that's coming to the verse. Big splendiferous shout out to the fam de la dig that and all my execs, Patreons, YouTube members, and super chatters. Salute, fly dirty citizens. Citizen.